So, okay, party ko sa akin, but how do we do this? Uh -huh. So, it's really very simple. Um, you have to have a ocean model. So, to get the hydrodynamic fields, the basic thing you need is velocities. It can be surface, it can be UV only, it can be three-dimensional uh, UV and W. And then if you have other variables there, um, if you have other variables there, uh, as, also as fields like temperature, salinity, or even model chlorophyll or nutrients, then you can sample along. And you can see like what is the environment uh, of those particles. So for hydrodynamic models, uh, we have many different flavors, most of you, probably have come in touch with some of them or are using some of them. Nemo, ROMs, DEL3D, FBCOM. HICOM is very common because they have a good application for the Caribbean. Uh, so yesterday we saw lots of people using it. So then on top of that, we need a Lagrangian particle tracking model. So it's basically a tool um, that will calculate the trajectories of particles as they are pushed around uh, by those velocity fields. So we have also a great variety of them and they are for different purposes. And I will explain you more about some of them. Um, so LTRANS is for uh, larvae and CMS also, but it can also have like oil applications or even sediment transport. Uh, Parcels is a generic tool, but it's developed by a group focusing on plastics. Ichthyop is mainly for fish and larvae. And open drips is also generic, but maybe a little bit uh, focused on oil dispersed. The equations that these models are solving is really very simple. Um, it's just your initial position Xn, and to that, um, you add a displacement caused by that velocity field over some period of time. Um, so you end up with that displacement. So just to move from this position uh, some amount of meters uh, in either direction, and that gives you your next position. And in that way, you calculate uh, a trajectory over time. It's really that uh, simple. And that's the equation these models are solving. And then you just solve it with a numerical method. It can be Euler. A uh, Ronke data four is very common because it's highly precise. And then to this, we can add stuff like, if your particle has a behavior, if it swims up or down, if it can have some dial vertical migration, it can be a larvae that is attracted to light, it can be a larvae that likes to stay at certain depth throughout their development, or it, you can have some sinking or some buoyancy if you're a sediment particle, or you can have for a random walk. And this tends to be a way to parameterize turbulence, or all of that motion that is not captured by your hydrodynamic model. The hydrodynamic models have some resolution. They have these grid cells, and they have the size, and they have a velocity vector for each of those boxes. Uh, the Lagrangian framework is continuous in time and space. So um, if you get velocities in every point in space and at every time just by interpolating that that you are getting from your hydrodynamic model. And so all of that small scale movement that is not captured um, by your ocean circulation model and that will cause you to diffuse and to go different ways, um, even if you start in the same location, that we consider subgrid scale turbulence. And we tend to model it as a random walk, either in the vertical, you just give it a little push uh, up and down or in the horizon. Anyway, uh, so when you run these models, when you end up is with these trajectories, we can look like a spaghetti mess. We actually call them spaghetti plots, those of just trajectories over space. So you need to do some sort of analysis of that um, to get to something useful like these connectivity matrices that can also be represented as networks. 
uh, here I was looking at oil and gas platforms in the North Sea. And then I ran some clustering analysis and I end up uh, with this network. So here, every color uh, cluster, some group of oil and gas platforms that are highly connected. Um, so there's a lot of post-processing into this while the modeling can be rather simple. As for ocean circulation modeling models, well, you have a variety of them and lots of them are freely available online. Uh, but you have to be careful uh, regarding the spatial and temporal resolution. We usually tend to rerun models to ocean circulation models to have high temporal resolution to then run particles on that because some of the output you can get online, it can be like five day means, weekly means, or monthly means. So that's, that will not help you to know how a particle is moving in the water. You need hourly velocity field if you want to capture, for example, the tidal cycle. You can get along with daily velocity fields if you just want to know where a thing moves mm -hmm. in a month, say. So it's all about the scales that you are interested in. You, of course, can have available fields from more mm -hmm. Caribbean 3D NEMO model that was shown yesterday in the presentations. This is at 8.8 kilometers around the horizontal resolution. And we have fields from 2010 to 2017 uh, for the long run without rivers. And currently we only have 2010 uh, with rivers. So these this velocity fields uh, or anything from it, you can get uh, from us. And tomorrow Judith will be showing some instructions and some interpretation for some specific sites uh, that you show interest on or earlier workshop in November. And also you can make your own. And I don't say this is easy, but it's doable. And you can possibly, if you want to get started with Demo, uh, go through this training. Uh, and people from Belize and maybe people from Mexico may have been having flashbacks to where when we met and we worked really hard on getting this to work on your own laptops. Uh, this is still live online, uh, but you may need to contact me uh, to bring live again some data links. But basically, you can run um, this application or that is um, a setup around the list PD, and you can run it in your laptop. This is a 3D model, but certainly a 2D model, a search Nemo model, you will be able to run it on a small computer or on a laptop. And we can certainly look at creating it together. So anyway, whatever you use for ocean circulation model, your Lagrangian, model will only be as good as that. So you would depend highly on it to um, resolve processes. But still there are some that are determined by, by the ocean circulation model and then there's some that can be added uh, into the particle tracking model. So the ones that are determined, determined for you by your ocean circulation model are currents, Stratification, it's whether your model is 3D in a 2D model, you will not get anything of that, whether it includes tides, um, whether it has some shear current effect, so you need to have a 3D model for it, and particularly the temporal and spatial resolution of the velocity field. As I say, it is common to rerun ocean models to just get high resolution uh, temporal uh, fields for that period of time that you are interested on in running particles. And then there are some other physical processes that you can add uh, when you do the particle tracking. So for example, wind drag, uh, you can add it on uh, using some parametrization in, in a wind product. Uh, the wave effect, you can add it also from a wave model, for example, and you can have this stock drifts component um, as a pushing on your particles on top of those currents you get from the ocean circulation model. 
turbulence, as I mentioned, we usually parameterize as a random walk, and this is to cover everything that is um, not represented in the ocean model. And of course, particle behavior. Your particles can move up and down, they can sink, uh, they, have, they can have some tendencies to stay at certain depth. Um, so for each application, there are other processes, but not necessarily uh, pure physics uh, that affect them. So, and they vary for each application. So it will depend, this type of processes will depend on whether you're looking at oil, plastics, marine larvae, sargassum, or other type of particles. Here I'm going to touch on in some of these. So for example, for oil, it turned out to be a very complicated thing to model because there is many other processes affecting it. For example, um, it can evaporate, it can degrade, it can have photooxidation, and of course, um, well, dispersion. So some of these processes are normal physical processes that affect everything, but some are specific to oil, like emulsification or biodegradation, or even ingestion by biota. Um, so this is a very recent review about oil spill modeling. There is lots of modeling, models focused on oil, lots of operational models, and lots of proprietary models out there. Um, this is just a recent review, so you will see a lot of models mentioned in there. Um, and this is how these various processes that are specific to oil, uh, they change over time. So you also have to have in account um, what is the point in time that you are modeling as of an oil spill uh, to, to then include the pertinent processes. And I'm putting all the links to papers there. And you should have uh, the slides on your email that got sent out this morning. So you have a Google Drive where you can access all of these materials so you can further look into anything of your interest. Then for plastic, um, we have also different types of, um, of processes affecting plastics specifically. Um, so plastics, there can be microplastics in the air and they can be, um, coming into the ocean. They can also aggregate, they can have chemical processes um, degrading them. They can resuspend, they can be ingested by biota uh, and they can also be bioturbated and come back uh, through resuspension into the water column after settlement. So this is just a diagram again uh, from a very recent um, review paper and i think the gradation of fragmentation is an important process for plastics that is meeting this diagram um, there are a lot of modeling efforts and groups out there at the moment it's, it's like a hot topic in microplastics and plastic debris tracking uh, so i'm just uh, showing you here one recent paper of this uh, track MDP, so track marine plastic debris, and what they are considering is a beaching, washing of advection turbulence, which are all normal physical processes, but then also biofouling, degrading, and sinking. And it's basically a sensitivity analysis of how this other process, specific to plastic, uh, change um, the location and the likelihood uh, of trajectory and arrival for plastics. And their main findings are that the vertical current shear uh, caused a lot of dispersion, that particle size has a lot of impact in the trajectory if the particle is spherical, but not so much if it's cylindrical. And that density and biofiling have a great impact on sinking and therefore alter the trajectory and the fate uh, of the plastic in the ocean. And as I say, there are many groups looking at this at the moment. And one of them is Topio. So this is tracking of plastic in our ocean. It's an ongoing project. 
and they are aiming to close the plastic budget. So there are a lot of plastic in the ocean surface, but more than 99% of it, uh, we don't know where it is. So they are aiming to find numbers to put in all of these question marks. Um, we know how much million tons enter the ocean every year from the coastlines and through the rivers. And then we know some of it is in the upper ocean and that's all we have quantified so far. And then we have all of these processes, um, physical processes, processes specific to plastics, and they are aiming to find um, those big numbers of where the rest of the plastic is going. So the processes that are, they are considering uh, are fragmentation, sinking, bleaching, wave mixing, and ingestion by biota. And it's a great group, and they have come up with uh, very useful tools. They have this little website, Plastic Adrift, where you can, you can visit this website, and it's like you click wherever you want in the ocean, and it's like tossing a rubber ducky there. And you can see how it evolves on time and where will it go and where will it end up. Um, and they also are the creators of Ocean Parcels, which is a very useful particle tracking tool. It's very easy to use and it's parallel, which means you can run millions of particles rather quickly if you have more than one processor. And then we have marine larvae. So which processes affect the dispersal of marine larvae? There is a great deal of biological factors. And I just have a list here. Um, so spawning grounds that will be where the adults go and release the eggs. That will be the starting location of your particles. Spawning season, that will be the time that can be season, month, tidal phase or maybe day or night hours. Some organisms are very, very specific uh, that they will spawn on a, the phase of, depending on the phase of the moon, depending on the water temperature, depending on the tidal phase, or even some of them just spawn during the night or some of them during the day. Uh, pelagic larval duration, that will be your drifting time. So the time for that larvae uh, to mature uh, while it's drifting. The competency period is this time window when they are ready to settle uh, and they are actively looking uh, or at least hoping to find uh, some settlement habitat, which will be the target arrival location. So it's a specific uh, habitat, either reefs, mangroves, or some specific isobat depth. Uh, and there is, of course, larval behavior, which gives them some control uh, of their vertical position mainly. Uh, so they can be buoyant or they can have vertical migrations if they're dial, so every day they go up and down, or ontogenetic, which means through their larval development, they have some depth preferences. And then we can have uh, survival or mortality, which depends of a lot of other different factors like food availability and predator, but we usually just apply it as a percentage uh, to modify settlement success. Uh, so basically, we kill a part of the happy particles that arrive uh, and settle. And then there can be also depending on some physiology. For example, larval duration can depend on temperature, and it does in the real world. So we have this little diagram in which we have a habitat with some parent population, and they release some eggs. And if they develop in warm waters, they will develop quickly, so their larval duration will be shorter. And they may, may end up being ready when there is no suitable habitat around them. In the other side, if they develop an, into cold waters and they take too, take too long to develop, they can also get carried away to unsuitable habitat or be where there can be lots of predators like this crab. So the planktonic stage are an opportunity for dispersal, which can be good in the sense that they can colonize distant habitats uh, or recolonize previously lost habitat, but they can also get lost to unsuitable habitat or, or get eaten by predators. So basically recruitment success is environmentally mediated. Um, 
so modeling larval connectivity is very important for the management. As I say, the ocean currents transport eggs and larvae, um, and they create these connections for populations. So they have important implications for habitat management and resource management because it affects the recruitment to commercial fisheries. And they also are very deterministic for the ecological resilience of a place. For example, um, it's very important to determine whether a population is open or closed, which is a matter of cell recruitment and spatial scale because you can have a habitat with your adult population here, but um, if they don't have this self-recruitment, it means that they are not self-sustainable. So they don't depend on the larvae and eggs they are producing locally. They depend on larvae and eggs that are coming from other places, which you may not be protecting at all. Um, so instead, if you have the self-recruitment, you can have a close population. And it's also a matter of a scale because if you have other habitats very close by, uh, you can call those two meta populations a close population. So you can then decide how much area you need to protect, for example, um, to encompass uh, the source and things of your population. So it has important ecological implications that need to be taken in account for marine spatial planning and for marine protected area design. Uh, as I say, it, this, whether you are a source or a sink and the level of interconnections between metapopulation also confer um, some ecological resilience because if you are if the habitat you are protecting is a sink region, it means that you are getting larvae and eggs from many other populations. So your likelihood to thrive is very high and you would like to protect this site because it will have a lot of variability in the gene pool of that population. Uh, in the same, in a similar fashion, it will be important to protect a source region because you know it is providing larvae for many other areas. Well, and that's it. Um, and then um, about that, we have a case study that is dispersal of larvae in the Caribbean arc, and that's going to be our last presentation of today, uh, where we look at larval dispersal in, in just this green area. And we have Valerie Legunek uh, coming up with that at the end, so stay tuned. And then we have our other topic of great importance in the Caribbean, which is sargassum. Well, this is an intro slide and most of you may already know all of this. So sargassum is a planktonic brown macroalgae. It's, um, it's common in the sargasso sea, and this is the happy infographic of NOAA. Uh, about sargassum on their happy ecosystem. The issue is that since 2011, it somehow started to wash off in the Caribbean beaches and causing a great economic impact because of tourism and fisheries effects. And it's also a human health issue because it comes in great masses and then it decomposes in the beach. A single uh, one of them looks innocent, floating little algae, but you get tons and tons of this, and that's when it is a problem. So there are lots of unknowns about this phenomenon. Um, where does it come from and why is that been the main question? And of course, what are the effects of this excessive amount um, of biomass that is coming in, into the ecosystem? So as for where it comes from, there are some theories, and I think this is the most current one. Uh, it seems that because of an extreme North Atlantic oscillation event, it changes um, the circulation of the Sargasso Sea during the winter of 2009 and 2010. So then it was somehow leaking. Um, towards the east. So some sargasso reach uh, the shore of 
Gibraltar. And then that population, uh, I mean, that, that little bit of sargassum, um, it thrived there and then it started to be transported um, with the North Equatorial Current southward until it established what we now know as the um, Atlantic uh, Sargassum Belt. So it encompasses the whole um, equatorial region in the Atlantic Ocean from America to Africa. And that is the source of the sargassum that we are getting into the Caribbean. And that's the situation. Um, it may, may have been the single event uh, of long dispersal of the sargassum from the original population that generated this new established population um, in the equatorial belt. And now we see a lot of interannual variability and seasonal variability on the dispersal of that sargassum into the Caribbean Sea and beaching in different places, um, causing lots of trouble to various countries. So what would be the process affecting the dispersal of sargassum? Uh, main thing is the starting location, which it's very great that we can have that from satellites. Um, they figure they can observe sargassum uh, from satellites. And now there is several different products um, that you can get uh, locations or distribution of sargassum uh, from satellites because it bobs at the interface of the ocean and the atmosphere it will have this effect of wind it and also because it's that surface uh floating algae it will affect it by stock drift so the wave effect uh, that cause surface transport beaching of course we don't know well, when a mat is floating near the coast and we get trapped and, and come hit the beach or when it will just flow out and, and go back uh, into the ocean. And then a specific process for sargassum that I think is very interesting and complex is this aggregation and disaggregation. Um, we can see uh, in this study, they look at this. So sargassum, you can find it as this disaggregated wind rows here in diagram A, or we can have uh, it start to, disaggregate uh, from long, uh, big, large rats, and it can disaggregate into this aligned, wind aligned stripe. Um, so you usually see these horizontal features, like long stripes of sargassum, or you can have huge mess, or you can have um, lots of tiny pieces floating around. And for that, people have been trying to model this specific process and um, Veron Vera and Miron, they have come up with this uh, little model of elastic inertia networks that seem to represent quite well uh, this process. But the thing is that now you are not just tracking a particle, you are tracking this elastic uh, object that can fragmentate um, or it can uh, come together into large drafts. So again, there's lots of groups looking at this uh, around the Caribbean in different countries. There is this group effort. Sargassum Hub is by the uh, International Oceanographic Commission, and it's an effort to just link people working on the sargassum issue, and they have their own overarching program. And we have this. Uh, this very active group uh, from Florida mainly. Uh, they are worried about the issue increasing there. And this is sargassum issues and solutions. They have some webinars you can access and they're quite interesting. They look at both the scientific uh, research uh, side of it and also to the practical solution um, possibilities, including lots of a private industry um, people. So if you go to that website, you will see their webinars are online. Um, and you can sign up to belong to any of these groups. 
So one of the latest uh, research papers that I found, it's still in preprints uh, under review at the moment, is this NEMO SARC-1, which is a sargassum model um, that integrates a physiology of, of this ma macroalgae and stranding surface surface velocities and um, and include fields of um, biochemical model uh, for the physiology. So here we have a comparison of the observed sargassum in the left and then the model in the right. And you can see, well, sort of for like presence in substance, it, it can be okay. And then for the amount um, of it, so the intensity of the colors here, you can see large difference uh, between the observations and this model. But they say, of course, overall, uh, the results demonstrate the ability of this model to reproduce and forecast the seasonal cycle um, and the larger scale distribution of sargassum. So check it out, uh, warning that it's still under review. And there are also some proprietary models like this SAM tool. Uh, which does provide a forecast, but is not free. Uh, and what they are doing is tracking particles uh, with a combination of currents and wind. And they are using uh, satellite uh, products um, as input, and they have a probabilistic approach to determine where is more likely that the sargassum will be. And you can visit the website. They do have a, a great amount of satellite products uh, for free. And then we have, this is not a model per se, but it's a very good source of information. The satellite-based sargassum watch system is by the University of South Florida, and they provide these bulletins, um, just comparing the current situation on months, of the current year with the historical uh, situation. And with that, they give a little um, information of whether this is going to be a terrible year regarding sarcasm or not. It's not modeling things per se. They do link um, the satellite product, which is this API alternate floating algal index. Uh, and these are all the details for those satellite, satellite incline. It's a one kilometer product. Um, and they provide it every day and then they follow various sources and then they do a weekly composite. And what they do is they provide concurrently the high com uh, model current vectors. So you can load this into Google Earth and it looks like this. And they have this catalog uh, clickable map uh, that is very useful from which uh, I am using this to get start my particle tracking for sargassum for the Caribbean wide uh, and also for the forecast uh, prototype system for the list. I'm using uh, these two images. I cannot see my one there. This one here, the Caribbean art is right here. Um, so this overlaps with the NEMO model in this area. And for the Belize uh, forecast system, we're using this image, which they call Yucatan. Okay, so as a little summary, I have this table um, and you can look at it at your own uh, by yourself because it will be repetitive. But the important bit here is that I'm including some suitable open source software that could be applied for each of these specific um, applications. So for oil, we have open drifts and CMS. Uh, for plastics, we can use parcels, of course. Um, for larvae, we can use Caltrans, CMS, or I picked you up. And for sargassum, uh, we can use parcels or open drift. Um, and here are the links to access all of these uh, softwares. And a good thing uh, that I didn't mark here is that some of these have uh, visual interfaces. So if you don't like terminals and you prefer clicking away, OpenDrift does have a visual interface as well as CMS and Ictio. 
And you can access them all online and they're rather easy to install and they don't have a great computational needs. So I believe you can indeed find them in your computers. And for the Nemo version of LTrans, I've developed that. Um, so, and I haven't made it publicly available, but it's on GitHub. So you can contact me and I can share that with you 